I'd like to welcome you here this morning to our worship service. I'd like to start off by thanking Tanner Unruh for uh, having the prelude, and we're looking forward to his special music and, and the slide presentation. And uh, would like to welcome all the visitors and guests, and uh, Tanner's family is here in support. And uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning. We ask that you be with us in our worship. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds and our souls to your message for us this day. We ask, Lord, that you continue to be with us and bless us with this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sam. I'll invite you to stand for our first hymn, number 25, in Voices Together, the purple book. So I think the, uh, the words will also be on the overhead, but if you want to see the music, you'll need to open up your books. Brethren, we have met to worship Lester's last. Does praise our God. Will you pray with all your power? Will you hear and preach the word? All is and rest the spirit of the Holy One. Come now, let's pray. Five hundred eighty four. This will be on the overhead also, uh, projected. <laughs> Jesus be 
the center. Be my source, be my light, Jesus. Verse 2. Jesus, be the center. Be my hope, be my song, Jesus. Refrain. Be the fire in my heart. Be the wind in these sails. Be the reason that I live, Jesus, Jesus. Verse 3. Jesus, be thy vision. Be my path, be my guide, Jesus. Refrain. Be the fire in my heart. Be the wind in these sails. Be the reason that I live, Jesus, Jesus. Verse 4. Jesus, be the center. Be my source, be my light, Jesus. Coda. Be the source, be my light, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And number 718. Gentle shepherd, Come and lead us, for we need you to help us find our way. Gentle shepherd, come and lead us, for we need your strength from day to day. There's no other we can turn to.
Thank you again, Tanner, and also your sister for helping with the special music. Thank you very much. Thank you. This time we will have the uh, Bible verses for the sermon, which is Joel. We'll wait until those get pulled up. Okay, starting with Joel 1, 1 through 4. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel, in an invasion of locusts. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, the other locusts have eaten. The fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The olive oil fall, fails. To spare you farmers, wail you vine growers, grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yields their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains. Because he is faithful, he sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust and the other locust and the locust swarm. My great army that I sent among you, you will have plenty to eat until you are full and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Let's bow for a word of prayer for our message today. Lord, we ask that you place upon Carla's heart a special message that our church needs. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds and our souls to listen to what she is sharing and to input it into our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, sisters and brothers here at Hopedale Mennonite Church. It is a pleasure to be among you this morning. I've enjoyed um, meeting several of you and finding some connections. I am Carla Stoltzfus Detweiler. I am the executive director at Hungry World Farm in Tiscawa, Illinois. My family and I moved there just over two years ago. Previously, we had been in Iowa, in the Iowa City area where I served as a pastor for 12 years at First Mennonite Church in Iowa City. So I've enjoyed making some connections there and um, also some connections through my mother-in-law. So my roots are in Virginia, but my husband's mother grew up in Metamora. Carol Bachman is her name. So um, we, I enjoy finding those connections as I travel in Illinois and share with different congregations. 
So <clears throat> I shared that I was a pastor, and I am an ordained minister in Mennonite Church USA, though now I'm not situated with a congregation. I'm a pastor of a farm. I get to be a pastor of um, a lot of different kinds of creatures. And so I bring you greetings this day from the sheep and the goats and the ducks and the chickens and the cows and, and some humans too that, that live at Hungry World Farm. And I bring greetings also from Willow Springs Mennonite Church. That is the congregation that birthed the vision for Hungry World Farm just over five years ago, or no, almost five years ago. I also bring greetings from one of your own, Scott Litweiler, joined our farm this summer, and I'm so grateful for his presence with us there. And I must, I think I must have some glimpse of the, the values of service and care that um, you embody here as I get to know him and some of his family members who have come to join us for some activities on the farm. <clears throat> so this morning I want to share just a bit with you about the ministry of Hungry World Farm and then also reflect with you on these words that we have heard from the prophet Joel. So for those of you, <clears throat> hmm, it's not advancing something I'm doing wrong. There we go. Thank you. So for those of you who may not know where Hungry World Farm is, we are located in Tiscawa, Illinois. It's about 75 miles, just about straight north of here. And we are on 175 acres of land. We have, um, through some research, know that this land was once home to Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Chippewa peoples who were relocated in the 1830s as some European settlers came to farm the area. The most recent stewards of this land are a group that you may have known about, Plow Creek Mennonite Fellowship um, was um, stewarding this land for about 40 years. And uh, the topography of Hunger Will Farm is different than the topography here. You have these nice open fields. Hunger Will Farm is located on two ridges um, with a valley in between. So our land is not big flat fields. We have 100 acres of forest, and then we have about two thirds of an acre of market garden, two acres of blueberries, a half acre of native prairie, and then a handful of human dwellings. Hunger Will Farms motto is nurturing the earth and nourishing people. And those two things go hand in hand. We nurture the earth by tending the soil. We recognize that soil is the foundation of life. We endeavor to practice and teach others the principles of regenerative agriculture, which focuses on renewing the soil by supporting the life of the billions of microbes that inhabit the soil. We also nurture the earth by stewarding our half acre of native prairie and our forest. And we nourish people. We do that by literally sharing food. We grow vegetables, fruits, eggs, meat, and um, also have a bakery, so we're making breads on the farm. And we share those nutrient-dense fresh foods with people, um, some people, buy those foods from us and we're happy when people are choose to buy from us we also share with people who have a harder time accessing really good food so far this year we've donated 3450 pounds of fresh produce to area emergency food agencies and that's 20 percent of the produce that we harvested on our farm this year we also participate in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, so that people can purchase from us using their SNAP EBT cards. And I think I saw something in your bulletin about a food pantry, maybe, that you are, some of you are involved with. And I'm just, yeah, say that's wonderful. What a wonderful extension of God's love. 
what I have noticed sometimes as I've shared, taken some of our produce to our local food pantry, is that sometimes the produce that arrives at food pantries is not the best. And I wonder who wants to eat these wrinkly peppers or pick through this slimy lettuce and eat this stuff. <laughs> so we are proud at Hunger World Farm to provide the first quality, fresh, really nutritious produce to food pantries and to Midwest Food Bank in Peoria so that people who can't afford that high quality food can have access to it. We also recognize that hunger for food is not the only kind of hunger that humans have. So at Hungry World Farm, we seek to nourish human hungers for connection with God and with creation and with one another. And we do that through fellowship gatherings, retreats, learning events, and our internship program. Our mission is this, seeking the well-being of all, Hungry World Farm inspires and educates about healthy fields, food, and bodies while caring for the earth. Behind that phrase, the well-being of all, is a Hebrew word that I'm guessing you're familiar with, shalom. It's that idea of peace, harmony that encompasses all of creation. Shalom is God's big dream for the world. It's what Jesus called the kingdom of God. Inherent in this idea of shalom is the understanding that the well-being of people and the well-being of the rest of creation, the soil, the air, the plants, the animals, it's all intertwined. To care for the soil and the myriad of creatures that call planet Earth home is to care for people. And conversely, to ignore the health of the Earth is also to fail to nurture the well-being of people. So we are um, practicing and teaching the the principles of regenerative agriculture. And the first principle of regenerative agriculture is know your context. In other words, pay attention to the land and the creatures who inhabit it because they have stories to tell and wisdom to share. I wonder how many of you are bird watchers or just like to, to see the creatures around you. So knowing your context is just paying attention to those creatures that share this, this home with us. So at Hungry World Farm, we are paying attention to the land and creatures who are our neighbors. And as we do that, we notice at Hungry World Farm, oh, some lush gardens, some beautiful birds, well-fed deer. I suspect you might have some of those around here too. Just a great diversity of living things that are supporting one another in this web of life. We also notice things like erratic weather. And you know, weather changes from year to year, but some people who've been around longer than I have say it's not as predictable as it used to be. This year we had a really long, cool spring, and then boop, it spiked really hot, like, like midsummer, really fast, and did crazy things in the garden. All these insects that have been dormant, all of a sudden, whoop, and then um, all my brassicas turned to lace. If you know what I mean, the leaves were just eaten. So, we notice things like that. We notice that the rain falls in torrents, and we have a creek running through our farm, the Plow Creek. And that <clears throat> creek, when it rains really hard, the water rushes so fast and it's ripping away the pasture where our sheep and goats graze. And we've lost 20, 50 feet of pasture at a time as the water carves away the land. Longtime residents of our area notice the decline of bird and insect populations and the loss of fertility from our soils. And though farming and agriculture are the basis for our rural economy, we also notice that many people are experiencing food insecurity and suffer from diseases related to diet. Why is that when our, the basis of our economy is growing food? 
If we zoom out and pay attention to reports of the health of the land and people in other places, we notice similar patterns around the world. Increasingly erratic rainfall, more and severe frequent drought, storms around the world that are making the work of growing food more and more challenging. Food insecurity is an ironic reality for agrarian people around the world, including a lot of agricultural workers in our own nation. More and more frequent and dangerous weather events disrupt the web of life over and over around the world. This week, some researchers from Yale University reported that there have been 29 one billion dollar weather disasters <clears throat> around the world so far in 2022. So, so they're looking at how much damage, the, the, the estimated cost of damage to weather events around the world. And they said there have been 29 so far this year that the damage is one billion dollars or more. And topping those 29, you might guess, are Hurricane Ian in the United States, and then also heat waves and drought that were really severe in Europe this summer and really affected their agricultural output in Europe this year. And then flooding in Pakistan, the top three weather events damaging this year. I feel like we in central Illinois are insulated. We haven't experienced these extremes quite as some of our neighbors around the globe. Um, but we've been touched by them maybe through connections. At Hunger World Farm, we've been praying for some farmer friends in Florida who were hit hard by Hurricane Ian. And this is a photo from their farm, 12 Seasons Farm in Fort Myers, Florida. And farmer Danny said that um, they lost most of their crops and infrastructure. All of their greenhouses were flattened by the powerful winds and then a big storm surge, I think like a big wave that came up the river, the Caloosahatchee River near them and just devastated their farm. So our hearts are heavy for people suffering so much loss um, in our own country and around the world. As followers of Jesus, we feel a tug. What, what can we do? We wanna reach out in compassion to these people who are experiencing so much suffering and one way that we respond, I'm so proud that we have Mennonite Disaster Service, and some of us can go and help clean up these places and bring hope to these devastated places. But I also wonder, is there anything that we can do to help calm the weather patterns that are making these disasters take place? Is there anything we humans can do to make a difference in the health of our planet. At Hunger Wolf Farm, we're just stewarding 175 acres of soil. What difference can we make for our neighbors around the world? As it turns out, we are not the first humans to experience ecological devastation. In the 5th century BCE, the nation of Israel faced an ecological crisis due to a plague, or it might be multiple plagues, of locusts. The prophet Joel witnessed the devastation of his community and gave voice to their concern. And he led his community on a journey from immense grief and despair toward hope and joy. I am convinced that Joel's response to that ecological crisis many years ago can offer wisdom to us 
in our time as inhabitants of this good earth that God made. The first thing to notice as we open the book of Joel is how Joel invites all the people to gather around and pay attention. Hear this, O elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Joel, it's like he's shouting it out to them. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell their children and tell it to the next generation. Apparently, what Joel has got to talk about is important stuff that we need to acknowledge and not forget. And what is this important message that Joel has to proclaim? It's the story of the devastation of the land. Like an invading army, these ravenous locusts have consumed everything in sight, devastating the fields and the economy for the people of Israel. And did you notice, devastate everything and evaporated the people's joy? I'm persuaded by Joel that the path toward healing and hope for our planet begins by naming out loud the devastations we witness, not downplaying the pain of loss or the uncertainty of the future, but naming these realities out loud and in community. Next, Joel calls his community together to mourn, to weep and wail for their loss. Did you notice in the text who is mourning, who is called to weep and wail? Verse 10 in the first chapter of Joel and it, it may um, be a different in different translations, but one, uh, in one translation it says, the fields are devastated, the ground mourns. Joel treats the ground as a living being. Of course, today, with the aid of soil science and microscopes, we know that the soil is alive, it's full of living microbes, fungi, earthworms, and insects. And Joel here is suggesting that this living holy ground is grieving. As we read further in the first chapter of Joel, we see that Joel recognizes that the soil is the foundation of community well-being. As Joel describes it, when the soil is grief-stricken, or out of balance, there's a chain reaction. The mourning of the soil is connected to the drying up of the crops and the trees, which is connected to the groaning of the animals, which is connected to the grief of the farmers, and ultimately the joy of the whole community withering. Joel understands that by God's design, the well-being or illness of the soil and the well-being or illness of all living things is interconnected. And when the soil, or could be, we could look at other aspects of creation, the oceans, the forests, when the animals are grieving, we are called to join their lament. So naming the devastation and grieving with creation. These are two ways that we, with Joel and his community, can begin to find hope in the face of ecological disaster. The next stretch on the path from despair to hope for Joel passes through the territory of repentance. Turn back to God with your whole heart, Joel, please. Weep, mourn, be sorry for your waywardness. Interesting here, unlike some other prophets, Joel doesn't spell out the sins of the people, but it's clear that something has hindered their loving connection with God. 
And so he pleads with the people to return to God, not because they're afraid of God's punishment, but turn to God like a wounded child who is turning toward her mother. Turn to God, Joel says, and you will find that God is gracious and loving, slow to anger, quick to forgive, abundantly tender-hearted. I wonder, as we consider the groaning of our planet, of our neighbors around the world, what do we need to turn away from in order to rediscover this gracious, deeply loving God? And what do we need to turn toward in order to find hope of restoration? I wonder if repentance, this turning away and turning toward, might look like paying attention to God at work in creation. Anybody here practice composting? Okay, a few of you. I love compost because to me it is grace in action. So, you know, we take our scraps, our coffee grounds, our banana peels, our carrot peels, we put them in a pile, and then God, with the help of a few million microbes and some air and some water, turns our scrap into amazing fertilizer, and it makes plants grow. It's grace right there at work in creation, in the soil. Paying attention to God at work in creation. Perhaps as we turn to God in creation, we'll notice resurrection happening all around us. One time I took some, <clears throat> I was planting my garden in the spring and just grabbed some sticks laying near the garden to mark my rows. I ran out of markers, so just stuck these, these dead sticks in the soil. A couple weeks later, I noticed that those sticks were sprouting leaves. What's going on here? I thought they were dead, but they were growing. Perhaps as we repent, turn away and turn toward, we will observe that this amazing world that God has created is abounding with grace and decidedly bent toward life toward regeneration, toward restoration, and resurrection. So for Joel, the path from despair to hope begins by naming the devastation out loud, grieving with all of creation. It winds through this territory of repentance and grace, and finally, it opens into a clearing, the country of trust-filled joy. Though, as Joel is writing this, the land is still devastated. Joel already exhibits a fierce trust in God's gracious, life-giving spirit that is always flowing, always healing. And from that place of trust, Joel proclaims, Do not fear, O soil. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Some translations say, Do not fear, O land of Judah. If you look in the Hebrew, that land, he's talking to that soil that was called to to join in the grieving. Now he's saying, do not fear, rejoice. Joel has witnessed God's healing work before, and he trusts that God will heal this devastated land. Now you remember how the, the, the devastation of the soil, there's this chain reaction and it leads to the, the grieving of everything and the evaporation of joy for the whole community. 
Well, here, God promises through Joel that the rejoicing of the soil will lead to the rejoicing of the whole community. The animals will forget their fear. The pastures turn green. The rains come. The orchards and vineyards are plentiful. The people will eat in plenty and be satisfied. Joel expects that the restored soil will re create a chain reaction, a cascade of health and joy for the entire community and for the land and all that it supports. As we look our world's ecological crisis in the face, I hear Joel calling us to joy-filled hope, trusting that the same resilience Joel expected of the land in his time still characterizes planet Earth today. In fact, this cascade of health that he describes is not just a beautiful vision or a promise for the future. It's a pattern of resilience that God has woven into the fabric of creation. Here's the pattern of resilience that I have learned about as I have spent time with our farmers, Farmer Stefan and Farmer Dave and others at Hungry World Farm. <clears throat> so there's a chain reaction of health that soil scientists and farmers have observed. When soils are minimally disturbed, as in no-till, when they're kept covered with cover crops, plant matter remains on the surface of the soil, roots stay intact. This builds soil biology. Those microbes love those roots. There's all kinds of life happening with those roots and those microbes in the soil, and organic matter builds. As you build organic matter, that enables the soil to absorb water more like a sponge. And instead of shedding off so much water, that, that shedding that causes flooding, the soil can hold the water when it rains. And then the moisture in the soil, of course, that encourages the growth of the plants and also those microbes that live in the soil and are doing so much good work for us. And then, of course, plants. They're amazing. <laughs> they photosynthesize. They take in the sunlight. They turn it into carbon and put it in the soil. And that's a really good thing. They also respire, giving oxygen to other, the other creatures need. And they also um, put some moisture back in the air. And so that it helps to create a balanced cycle, a water cycle, um, the air. All of this is good news for our health, for the health of the whole system. It's a cascade <clears throat> of health that becomes a virtuous cycle of restoration for soil, water, air, plants, <clears throat> animals, and people. Do not fear, O oh soil. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done and is doing great things. Do not be afraid, animals of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. Rejoice, children of Zion, rejoice. Joel's invitation to his community at a time of crisis and to us today, I believe, is fourfold. Name the devastation out loud in community. Grieve together with our neighbors who are all kinds of creatures that share this earth. Turn toward God who is quick to forgive and abounds in steadfast love. And rejoice because God has done and will do great things. Like Joel, we are called to be hopeful, even joyful, as we trust that not only are humans at work, but God is at work restoring God's beloved creation through soil microbes, 
through plants and trees, through scientists and inventors, through homemakers and farmers, through children and elders, through you and me, God is doing great things. Through the spirit of our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, God is inviting us to participate in miracles of resurrection and restoration for the soil, for ourselves and all our neighbors on planet Earth. My siblings in Christ, may we together rejoice and be glad as we witness and participate in the great things that God is doing in and through creation. And in the words of the prophet Joel, may you, my friends, eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. Amen. For a hymn of response number 745, 745. God who's giving knows no ending from your rich and endless store. Nature's wonder, Jesus' wisdom, lost because brave shattered door. Just want to say thank you again for the opportunity to share with you today and wanted to just share also some opportunities for connecting with hunger world farm if you're curious if you'd like to um, connect with us further we invite you to come and visit us come to hunger world farm it's a beautiful drive 
come just for rest and renewal. We have an Airbnb apartment, we have a retreat cabin, you're welcome to do that. We also welcome volunteers. If uh, you or a group of friends or um, family members would like to come hang out with us, we have projects on the farm uh, related to the gardens, fencing, clearing brush, also um, lots of building maintenance kinds of projects. And we also have learning events that uh, if you go to our website and sign up for our newsletter, you'll get updates about learning events happening. This year we had a, a worm composting workshop. We look forward to having workshops on um, baking and gardening kinds of things. Also, right now we're in a job search looking for a lead market gardener. Stefan Rao has been our, our market gardener and he's transitioning to a new position of more oversight to the, the whole land. And so we're looking for someone with a passion for gardening and has some experience with market gardening. So if you know anyone who might love to be a salaried market gardener, send them our way. We're also, we'll be looking for a livestock apprentice, someone to work closely with farmer Dave in care for sheep and goats and chickens and a handful of other kinds of animals. And then we have an internship program. So anyone who is curious about regenerative agriculture and would like um, a summer kind of experience on the farm, please send them our way. We are a nonprofit organization. We welcome your financial contributions. We are so grateful to people of faith and neighbors who want to join us in this mission of nurturing the earth and nourishing people. We'll have um, a year-end fundraiser coming up, Giving Tuesday, and, and then year-end fundraiser. So if you would like to support us financially, we would appreciate that. And also would really invite your prayers for Hungry World Farm specific prayer requests now are for the staff that we are hoping to recruit and another um, item i'd welcome your prayers for we're in a process of discernment right now about the possibility of hosting a refugee or asylum seeking family on the farm and looking for community partners and just a clear path for that so we would welcome your prayer um, prayers for discernment for us in that journey so um, if you are interested, I have one more slide if I can advance to that. I'm not getting it. Okay, yep. So again, um, check out our website to sign up for our newsletter or reach out to me by email or phone if you have questions. Thank you so much. Okay, Nathan, if you could put that song up on the projection here. And go to the next sign. Next one. This is a Korean song that it's new to us. The melody you'll kind of uh, recognize as being uh, kind of oriental in nature. And uh, it's a, just a beautiful song, and I thought we should learn it. We'll sing this through for you once, and then we'll invite you to join us. <laughs> May the peace of Christ be with you. May the love of Christ dwell deep in your heart. May the Spirit enlighten your way. May you live in the comfort of God's care. I invite you to stand. And as you learn this, uh, it's easy to kind of look across and, and see other people here worshiping. And we can use this as a song to sing to each other as we send ourselves on our way, each other on our way. We'll sing this through, how about three times? That'd be a good time, good number of times to maybe get it into our heads. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the love of Christ dwell deep in your heart. May the Spirit enlighten your way. May you live in the comfort of God's care. May the peace of Christ. 
Christ be with you. May the love of Christ dwell deep in your heart. May the Spirit enlighten your way. May you live in the comfort of God's care. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the love of Christ dwell deep in your heart. May the Spirit enlighten your way. May you live in the comfort of God's care. I lost track. I guess that was three. Bob, you want people to stay standing? or Okay. Okay, Nathan, if we could have the Bible memory verse. If you can respond with me. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. Psalms 143.10. You are dismissed. Go in fellowship.